probably just didn't know what he was locking in on when we walked back into class. Okay, so we're going to finish up talking about the other two sheets that I handed out. And again, for our online students, um, this is the, there's a, an upload to D2L. It's just an Excel sheet. This should be tab two and three for you guys. Um, but we're going to be talking about balance sheet and statement of cash flows. Again, objectives. Here's kind of our agenda for this section. So we're going to talk about assets long-term and current property and equipment, and then we're going to go into liabilities um, and talk a little bit from that, that in order to keep my sheets with me this time. Um, so balance sheet basics. Yep, I forgot I had a video for this one. I thought I did. So just another kind of little quick intro video. Oh, no. Dang it. Sorry. Well, they disabled it for, you have to go to YouTube and watch it, apparently. So if it takes a long time to come up, we'll just skip over it and I'll post the link. So let me pause it right here. Um, those of you that's had like Epi and Bio, where else have you heard something called like a snapshot in time? When you Oh, like a, like a yeah, like a histogram. Yeah. We're looking at like just a snapshot in time. Yeah. Like we just took a camera and took a picture of this is what's happening. That doesn't mean this is what's going to be happening two minutes from now, but this is what's happening at this current right. moment in time. Please What they say our formula is for the balance sheet when we're looking at minus liabilities minus equity. Assets minus liability equals equity. So just remember, you know, you may, it's going to be another one of those. Um, you know, if I give you the assets and the equity, you should be able to find the liability just by doing some moving around, right? So if you could just remember one form, whatever it is, you know, assets equal liability plus equity. However, the best way for you to remember, just remember, you know, assets minus liability equals equity um, when we're talking about balance sheets. So balance sheets is going to give you, you know, like the video gave us the intro to assets of the organization. So that's cash, that's capital equipment, and it's going to give us liabilities and equity. So how we're financing those assets that we have. And that's why everything has to balance, right? So we're saying we've got this amount of assets in. But this is how we're financing it. So everything should balance out. Um, and that's why it's called balance sheet. So again, you know, kind of like a histogram if you've had uh, bio stats or epi before. Um, just think of it as I'm just taking a camera and snapshot in time. That's what it's looking like right now at this very moment. So you'll see, uh, let's see if it's on this one. No. Um, so just a business's position at just one point in time. Um, so how is that going to differ from the income statement? Um, that's like a whole year's worth, not just that one previous. Right, so on the income statement, you know, if you look at the top, we said year ending and da-da-da. So for the balance sheet, we're just looking at December 31st, 2015 and December 31st, 2014. This is our snapshot. Um, 
So income statement does not provide information about how resources are kind of allocated out or what resources we need to produce the income. And again, going back up to how we're financing those resources. And that's why we need the balance sheet. You know, they're all interconnected. So we need the balance sheet to tell us how we're financing all the assets we, we've got in. Um, so balance sheet, we kind of, um, on this slide, it's organized left to right on your sheet here. Uh, we're organizing it from upper section and lower section, but sometimes you may see it laid out kind of landscape and they will um, organize it left to right. So just be aware of that. You're always going to see, you should always see the assets first. Um, so you're going to see assets, you're going to have current and long term. It's going to give you your total asset. And then you're going to have liability and equity, um, which is going to give you uh, current liabilities as, long, as well as long term because, you know, we have to balance. And then we're going to have our equity that's left over um, into our assets. So total liabilities and equity. <clears throat> uh, so the basic counting equation, like the video showed us, whatever way is going to be the best way for you to remember, I presented as A equals L plus E. The video gave A minus L equals E. All the same thing. We just move things around. Um, but if you just remember assets are going to equal your liabilities plus your equity, you'll be good on the account equation. So um, why would we often say equity equals assets plus liability? Because that's what you're looking for, right? So e equity is kind of the residual amount that's left over, right? Yeah. Equity is how much, you know, you have equity in your house, right? You, you pay into your mortgage and you're vested into your... Your mortgage so you have equity left over um, so it, it works to kind of highlight that that point that hey equity is residual left over um, uh, on our assets so again you know you, like I said you can think of man those are bad colors on that slide I'm sorry <laughs> that, is, that is really hard to read um, it's so balance it's, uh, it's easier it's on ours. oh is it on yeah. okay so balance sheets, really think about them. Like I said, it's your mortgage. If you have a house, you know, you think of it in terms of home ownership. So you have your, your asset, which is your home. Um, you know, some, some people are lucky to afford $300,000 homes. I'm not one of those people. Um, so total assets is going to equal 300000 So when you look at the liability and equity side, you're going to have your mortgage which is 200000 and maybe you paid in 100000 on your down payment um, in terms of equity, so you're vested 100000 in. You're 100000 you own $100,000 in that house already. So your total liability and equity should balance out with what the asset is worth. And again, you know, assets equal liability plus equity. So we are on the balance sheet. This is the same information that's on your balance sheet, less these totals that were not filled in on purpose, um, just so you wouldn't have to keep flipping back and forth if you're on the slide. So under assets, we should have our cash, our short term, our accounts receivable, and our inventory. Now this is set up in a particular way, and I can't remember if I go into it on the next slide. Maybe I do, if I don't, I'll go into it. Um, so we have current assets, why that did that? That's weird. Um, current assets, cash, short-term investments, account receivable, inventories is going to give us our total current assets, fifty-four thousand. Just add all these together. Our long-term investments, and then we're going to have our property and equipment. So this is things like land that we own, buildings that we own. Um, we're going to account for depreciation here because we know our equipment and our land and our you know holdings depreciate. So we're going to have our net fixed assets, and that's going to give us our total assets. So we're just combining these three together, 52, 48, 54, um, and that's going to give us 154, 815 in 2015, and then 115, 101 in 2014. Everyone see that? So it's the total assets, long-term investments, and the net fixed assets. Okay. Remember how you can check it when we move into liabilities and equity. If it doesn't balance, you mess the math up somewhere. Okay. Yep. You need me to go back? Oh, did you need me to go back? No, I'm, okay. just, I'm just checking the number. Okay. If I mess 
math up, please let me know, because <laughs> I was trying to fix this on the fly. Didn't realize what time it was. Um, so assets uh, or anything that's going to create or enable us to possess some kind of economic benefit. So we have current, which we are going to consider more short term. Um, like I said, these are our any cash we have on hand or short term investments that last uh, a year or shorter. And then our long term investments. So this is going to be leases that we have on land, building, property equipment. If we have a piece of equipment that we have a lease for, I don't know, let's say 10 or 15 years, that's going to be a long term investment. So the way, so look back to, let's jump back real quick uh, for our folks online too. Look at the way that these current assets are listed. Cash, short term, net patient, inventory, long term, with property, land, on down, on down. So they're listed that way, specifically listed that way. They just weren't kind of like jumbled up there and, and thrown up there. So current assets are very, very liquid. So what does liquidity mean if mm -hmm. something's very liquid? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very good. That, that's a good assumption. Yeah. <laughs> no, if it's liquid, that means if for some reason, let's say one of our loan holders calls up our loan, Li liquidity means, and, and I'll use cash for this example, it's very liquid. If they call up our loan, we can take that cash and pay that loan. It doesn't take a lot to convert that over to money to make that transaction, right? So they're listed in order of liquidity. Very liquid, next liquid, and on down, not so liquid, right? We can't convert land over fairly, you know, fairly quickly, especially in today's market. Um, so other assets that are gonna be expected to convert to cash within a year, and again, listed in a specific order. Uh, we have cash equivalent, short-term investments, uh, accounts receivable, and then we have inventories in, term, in order of liquidity. Um, so current assets, again, you know, they're very important to the firm's liquidity for the reasons we just said, because we can convert them over to cash very, very quickly. Um, so how do we measure that liquidity uh, ratio or margin? We have something called net working capital. And that is, you know, another ratio that we're going to, I'm slowly trying to introduce these to you before we kind of like jump all all in, but net working capital is going to be your current assets minus your current liabilities. So if we look here, what's our, let me write this on the board. So what's our total current assets off of our balance sheet? Current assets is, yes. Oh, 36. Or 306, right? Okay. And then what is our current liabilities? 1525. So if we subtract uh, our current liabilities from our current assets, what are what's our net working capital going to be? 38881. 38881? Mm-hmm. So we have a net working capital. 38, I'm trusting your math is right because I didn't do it in my head. 38,881 is going to be our net working capital. So that's going to be our measure of liquidity for the business. So that's how, how much we can convert over to cash very, very quickly. <clears throat> oh, you were right. 38,881. Well, um, I didn't actually do it. I'll do it. <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did. You did. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for keeping me in line and, <laughs> and checking on me. Um, so our net working capital is going to be 38881, and that's just going to tell us how liquid our assets versus our liabilities are and how quickly we can convert those things over to cash. Um, so when we talk about the line item for cash, the first one there under your assets, this is going to represent actual cash that we, we actually have in hand. We can go grab it. This is cash we have um, at this current moment in time. And then anything we have kind of left over in checking accounts or, you know, a lot of people don't walk around with cash now. We have, you know, a lot of in the bank. Um, I think it's kind of rare to see people walk around with cash now. I always have some just in case something happens and I break down. I don't even have a bank in the state. Do what? I don't even have a bank in the state. 
think in this state. Okay. No, no cash. <laughs> um, so cash, robbed. <laughs> cash equivalents, um, these are going to be things that have maturities of three months or less. So a couple examples of these are just like short-term, short-term investments, things that are going to, that are going to mature um, and be able to com be converted over in three months or less. <clears throat> and so in your opinion, how much um, cash, and cash equivalents do you think a business should hold on hand? Depends on the business size. It does. Depends on the business size. That's going to be different between smaller organizations and larger ones. But they really want to hold only enough on hand to pay any reoccurring expenses they have. So you want to have enough days. You want to know this is a ratio we're going to get to within the next lecture or two. Um, but you want to have enough days, cap you want to calculate something called your days cash on hand so you know how long you can, so if everything else, if all your revenue dried up, you want to know how long you can survive with the days cash, how many days cash on hand you can survive to pay your reoccurring operating expenses. So that's why we want to, we want to know what our days cash on hand are um, and we want to know what our reoccurring operating expenses are so we can make sure we have enough to pay if something happens. So short-term investments, uh, more like marketable securities, these are highly liquid, um, right under cash, uh, typically more low risk, uh, maturity at less than a year because they are short-term. Um, and remember, long-term investments are gonna be things that have a maturity of a year or more. Um, and then we have net, net, patient, count, net patient accounts receivable. Um, so think back to what we just learned in chapter three. So these are going to be revenues that we've built out, but we haven't received anything yet. So they're going to be held in this accounts receivable while we're waiting on the money to come in. Um, so we haven't collected that piece of the revenue yet. So why do you think businesses would kind of go through and even mess with holding short-term investments? Why would we want some short-term investments? Well, why do people get, why do you get a CD? Those are fairly so short-term, right? Yeah, you have something in case of uh, you know, unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. and you know, if you put your money in a CD, you're growing interest that's on it, right? That's right. kind of a like a safe, not a savings vehicle, but that's a, just another income stream that you can have. Um, and it's just you know, if you invest, it's just why we invest the way we do. We want a diversified portfolio, right? We don't want everything in cash. We don't want everything in investments. But we want a good mix of both in there. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why businesses would hold short-term investments. But we just want a good kind of diversification going on. So current assets. Um, when we look at inventories, let me keep going. Um, when we look at inventories, this one's a tricky one um, because you want to get, this kind of ties into quality improvement and kind of inventory management because you want enough supplies to get you through your normal operating activities. But what's going to happen if you overorder or you have too much supplies or you can't really anticipate what your usage is going to be and, and why you... Even though they're considered an asset, a lot of people consider them a liability because if they're sitting on the shelf and you don't have a good pool, it's called a pool system. If you don't have a good pool system to make sure your inventory is rotating in and out, that inventory at the back is going to sit there and expire. And then what happens? You have to waste it. You just have to waste it. It's like crumpling up a $100 bill and throwing it right down into the trash can. So dollar, uh, so inventory is just thinking about, you know, especially in healthcare, you know, this is primarily going to be our medical supplies, and you want to keep a particular eye on things like pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, every medical supply expires, even sterile water exp expires. I don't know how, but <laughs> it's just water that's sterile, but it does expire. So we want to make sure that we have a good pool system in place and. Um, one of the last things we're going to talk about in this class is kind of summation of having that good pool system in place um, in materials management to make sure you have that good flow built in there. 
Um, so only supplies that are consumed while treating the patients are expensed out on the income statement and on the balance sheet. Um, because remember what we talked about the last chapter, we only expense the supplies when we use them in patient care. Um, so small inventory balances are sometimes going to be put under uh, other current assets, just kind of as an aside there. So current assets, again, you know, we've already talked about this. They're, they're put in the order of liquidity. Um, these are things that uh, we must have to support the operations of our business. Um, and again, you know, order of liquidity nearest to cash. So cash, how do you get nearest to cash than cash? So you have cash, short-term investments, you know, three months or less, um, net patient accounts receivable, and then inventory because, you know, it can, it has a potential to sit on the shelf for a long time if we don't have a good full system in place. So when we move down to kind of the next uh, little section down there, we have long-term investments. Again, long-term, thinking Think about it as anything that's going to take a year or more to mature or to come to maturity. Um, so in short-term investments, we had a year or less. And, you know, because financing is not confusing enough, um, everything can be known by something else. Um, so long-term investments are also called funded depreciations. Um, so if you ever see funded depreciations, that's just another fancy term for long-term investments. Um, because they're funded by depreciation cash flow. So we purchase real assets at some, so we can purchase real assets at some point in the future, like land or buildings or equipment, things like that. Um, the next thing we have, property and equipment, just moving right on down the list. Um, these are real assets, but they're fixed. Um, we can't, you know, we can't exchange them out on the market. They're fixed assets for us. So, in comparison to long-term investments, um, you know, we can sell that stock or sell that investment out. Um, fixed assets are a little harder to kind of convert over to cash because they are fixed. We have to go through the selling of land, the selling of equipment, property, things like that. Um, let me, oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, so, you know, when you think about net property equipment, this is just things like your brick and mortar, they're physically there. <clears throat> uh, net property, it's going to be calculated at historical cost um, over book value, which is the estimate of what the property is actually worth today. Um, sorry, keeping track on time. Make sure we're going to finish on time. Um, and uh, they, they are very liquid, but not as liquid as probably the other things listed under your assets here, just because it can be a little harder to turn over. So footnotes, uh, this is just an example of how that might look on your financial sheet um, for property and equipment. So you take your gross property and equipment. Actually, let me go up here so my online people can see. Um, so you take gross property and equipments. This is your gross, right? The total amount. We have it at 88,549. But we're going to subtract out of that how much that property and equipment has depreciated. So we're going to take 30. It's depreciated down 36,000, which is going to give us that net of 52. Um, so so we're going to post this again, you know, on the balance sheet as the original gross cost, and take that depreciation amount out and we're going to continue to reduce that each year by the set depreciation amount until we reach the end of life for that building, for that equipment, for whatever, whatever that may be. Is everybody tracking before we move into liabilities? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to keep trucking on through here because unless anybody needs a break right now. If you do need a break, feel free to just you know, get up and walk out. Um, so now we're moving into liabilities and equipment. Um, kind of middle part of your, your handout here. Um, again, we're going to end with total liabilities because L plus E. So we're going to add our uh, liabilities, total liabilities. We have current, and then we have our long-term debt thrown in there, which is going to give us our total liabilities. Add that to our net assets for our equity. And that's going to give us 154,815, 
115,101. And so check that with what we just come up with total assets, right? So they balance out. Um, 2015, we had total assets of one. What's up? Um, so 2015, we had total assets of 154,815. And that's going to equal what our liabilities. Uh, 747 plus our equity. Uh, so everything should balance out on the balance sheet between assets equal liability plus equity. So liabilities, again, you know, just uh, claims we have on assets, how are we going out and financing all the assets that we just reported on the top half of the balance sheet? How are we kind of financing and paying for those? Um, and what are those things fixed by contract, meaning, um, you know, what are those things that we have negotiated terms, there's a contract in place for these different liabilities that we have um, in terms of fixed financial obligations for the business. So they're, they're fixed, they're hardwired into the business. But what, consider this question here, so what claims would workers have on liabilities? So let's just take this kind of one piece at a time. What kind of claim do you think the workers would have when we look at liabilities? And think, and you may need to pull from your income sheet here. What do you think? What kind of, if you were a worker, what kind of claim would you have on the liabilities to an organization? Or what's an organization going to owe to you as the employee? Insurance. Your insurance, yeah. Salaries, benefits, things like that. Yes. What about your tax authorities? Yeah. Your unpaid taxes, right? So we have workers are going to claim uh, salaries and benefits. Tax authorities are going to claim your unpaid taxes, vendors, supplies, any um, invoices that you owe out to them, uh, or credits, uh, things like that for supplies that you purchase. And so failure to kind of meet these different things, and this is why we have to be really vigilant with our balance sheet, it can cause us into, to go into bankruptcy and close. So we have to really make sure that our calculations are on point when we look at uh, our balance sheet and making sure everything kind of balances out. Now, who do you think holds the largest obligation? CFO. Well, I mean, in terms of who would we owe the most to? Oh, like um, people that are lending us money. Yeah, our creditors, right? Because chances are, if you're a large organization, you're going to have a lot of debt that you're financing because... Um, you built a new facility, you know, if you don't have the cash on hand to pay for that, you're going to have to take out a loan to finance that. So creditors usually are our largest obligation between uh, loans that we have to take out and money that we owe to our vendors and suppliers in terms of credits and things like that. So current liabilities, things that are going to be paid in, in one year, just like our assets, you know, we're looking at one-year terms, and our most common out there. Uh, notes payable, uh, so these are bank loans, uh, and more along, along, uh, bleh, more along the lines of short-term debt. Um, so we have an accounts receivable side where we're expecting money in, where we have an accounts payable side on the reverse, um, where we've incurred some <laughs> kind of debt, and then any accrued expenses. And these are, you know, utilities, wages, things like that that we're going to pay out bi-weekly or or, you know, if you're like ETSU, we get paid monthly. So our monthly wage payout is going to be an accrued, accrued, accrued expense for ETSU. So notes payable, um, we'll take a look at each one of these short-term debt obligations. Again, a year or less. Um, and these come in the form of lines of credit. Um, so you can think of like a credit card, right? So maybe everybody has a credit card. I have... Two, one I use for gas and one I use for emergencies. Um, so the credit card company is giving me a line of credit, and then my obligation to them is to pay my bill, whether I'm going to pay it in full at the end of the month or at the end of the cycle, or if I'm going to pay the minimum payment and 
oftentimes businesses will go through and make that minimum payment, but what's going to happen if we're making that minimum payment over and over? The interest is going to accrue, right? Um, so hopefully you do have a good card you can pull off at the end of the month. <laughs> if you have one, it's a good habit to get into. Um, so we're financing temporary increases in our current assets. So we're using lines of credit to buy supplies um, or equipment that we need from our vendors. Uh, trade credit. Um, well, let me get this one out here. Hold on. Trade. Is that one free? Oh, okay. Uh, trade credit. <laughs> trade credit. Um, offered to businesses with credit terms. So this is going to come in the uh, in the form of net 30, or sometimes you'll call it, see it called net 15. Um, and that just means that we're giving you terms of net 30. If I'm selling you cheat or something, I'm going to give you terms of net 30, meaning you're going to have 30 days to pay me back. And if you don't pay me back in 30 days, then we're going to have to start escalating out, or you're going to get late fees or interest accrued. Interest accrued. Um, so net 30, sometimes you'll see net 15. Uh, but usually the standard what we see is net 30 out there. Uh, and so we carry that over into accounts payable because we haven't paid it yet. We're owing them on credit. Um, accrued, ex accrued expenses, so obligations uh, to, the, to the business or of the business, excuse me. And this comes again in terms of salary, taxes, interest payments. Um, so in the example we have here, we have wages that are going to be earned in the last week of December, but they're not paid until the first week of January. So these wages will go on the December 31st balance sheet as an accrual because we owe those wages out, right? Long-term debt, uh, again, you know, contrasting the short-term debt, we're looking at greater than one year here. Um, so we have uh, loans that we take out from banks called term loans, and usually it's like a 20 or 30 term, you know, think about buying a house, you usually get like a 30 year mortgage. Uh, sometimes you get a 15 year mortgage. So long term credit from commercial banks um, and larger businesses. So if you have really, really large health systems, um, especially more, you might see this more on the for profit side, but they'll sell or issue bonds out like on the, on the market exchange. Um, <laughs> And then moving from long-term debt kind of to the bottom of our balance sheet, we have non-liability claims in terms of equity against our assets. So these are not fixed by a contract. Um, these are in investor-owned businesses. It's the amount of owner supplied financing. And then in non-for-profit, it's the amount of capital supplied by the, com by the community. Excuse me. So again, you just remember our basic accounting equation. However you want to remember it, A minus L equals E, assets minus liabilities equal equity. But I like to do assets equal liability plus equity because equity and liability are on the same kind of side of the balance sheet. It just helps me remember where everything goes. <clears throat> and then again, what did we just talk about in the last chapter? What are, what are non-for-profits required to do in front of our residual earnings? Since we're non-for-profit. Go into this. Yeah. yeah, we have to reinvest it into the business, right? We don't pay out yeah. to shareholders in terms of dividends or anything. So what does equity, um, in terms of the balance sheet, do probably more than anything else? Like, what do you think its main purpose is when you look at it in terms of the balance sheet? <laughs> so, uh, equity is going to really distinguish ownership status from investor-owned and non-for-profit. So, you should be able to just go in and look um, at the equity and see in non-for-profit, the equity is going to be called net assets, um, and it's the dollar value of the assets net of liabilities. That's why it's called net, uh, net assets, um, and in for-profit, you're going to see it called equity. Um, but in non-for-profit, we're going to see it called net assets. I think that's how I set it up on this sheet, too. Uh, yeah, so see there at the bottom, net assets, and in parentheses, it has equity. So you can really, you, you know, you can take a quick glance, look in, and 
kind of tell at a quick glance whether an organization is for profit or investor owned and the for non for profit just based on how they label a couple things. Um, in a non for profit, you know, we've already kind of went over this, but the net income flows to the equity section of the balance sheet. Um, and in for profit, the net income is going to be paid out in dividends first. And then the remainder is going to flow over in the balance sheet because they have to pay out dividends to their shareholders. Um, the right side, where's my balance sheet? Uh, the right, the right side or the top side, uh, excuse me, the bottom side or the right side of the balance sheet is going to give us a mix of what our debt financing looks like and our equity financing, and we're going to call this, you know, this view that it's giving us. Our capital structure so it's gonna be really key because it's gonna affect our overall risk in terms of you know what kind of rating we get or what kind of interest we get on loans or kind of how we're handled from a, a, a perspective of somebody who's gonna give us a loan like a bank or, or another organization or something like that in terms of cost of financing um, so capital structure just one of those key pieces when we look at the right side of our balance sheet or the bottom half of our balance sheet because it's going to give us a good picture of our overall risk versus um, and our cost of financing. Everybody good? We'll still keep going through if you guys are. Mm -hmm. Statement of cash flows. Um, just a little background into statement of cash flows and this is the one that's kind of laid out landscape for you guys. Um, so since it's been required um, not as long as the other income state or the other financial statements like the balance and the income statement, um, but it, it's fairly newer, um, being required since 1989. Um, and for non for profits, it wasn't required until 1995. Um, so still, you know, not still kind of fairly new, I guess. Um, not as old as the uh, as the other two sheets we've already talked about today. But it really came about because, you know, stakeholders want to know more information about how is money moving within the organization. And that's what cash flow, the statement of cash flows is going to tell us is how we're moving money around within the organization and kind of how it flows through our organization. So, you know, we said all the financial statements are interconnected and the, the statement of cash flows kind of brings together the best of both worlds of your income and your balance sheet. So it's going to create a report that looks very similar to our uh, income statement, but again, it's going to focus on how cash is moving through our organization and how that cash is kind of flowing through. And so it's going to answer three questions for us. Where did we get the cash? What did we do with the cash? And how did the cash's position change within our organization? So we're looking at where did it go, or where did we get it, what did we do with it, and how did it change within our organization? The three main questions. Um, I probably put that on your self-building study guide. Um, so what do you think? Is this kind of valuable information on yes. report? Yeah. Why would it be valuable? Mm -hmm. From a stakeholder's perspective, they definitely know what you're doing with the money. If they're going to ask me a part of investing in something. Yeah, yeah, I want to know how the cash is. I want to know that I'm investing in a reputable business, right? Um, so by the combination of these three sheets, we should get a good look into what's going on with the business to kind of help us make more sound decisions on how we're going to manage our money in terms of what we're going to invest in um, and it lets us know where, where the business is going to get its money and what kind of happened to that cash. So we report transactions over some period of time, uh, just like the income statement. Uh, and it's invite, divided into three different sections. So you can see we have our cash flow from operating. That's the what did we do part. Um, the cash flow from our investing activities, these are more of our fixed assets, so we're going to have to go back over into our balance sheet. And then our cash flows from our financing activities um, in terms of our securities. And the bottom part, that uh, cash flow from financing is going to reconcile the change in cash on the, on the statement with the cash on the balance sheet. So that's why we need all these different forms to come together and kind of create this statement of cash flows. 
So what you should see, uh, let me just make sure. So you should have your operating income, 3747. We should have our adjust. Is this what you were asking about earlier? The adjustments. It seemed like it. Okay, that just clicked like for it. me. <laughs> <laughs> but we should. We have our operating income initially. We're going to make some adjustments. We know because we're going to have depreciation. We know our accounts receivable is going to go up because we're still offering services. But we know people are not, you know, paying their bills in as we're sending them out. Essentially, we're going to be buying more things, right? So we're going to increase our inventory. You know, that's going to put us down just a little. Um, we're going to hopefully decrease our accounts payable, so we're paying our bills out on time. And then increase in our accruals. So that's going to give us our net cash from operating, or from operations, excuse me. So you're just going to take all this and add it together, right? So you should, you know, you should get, in this case, we got just a little bit more than what we initially start out with our operating income. And that's mainly because we had these increases and decreases right here that we had to account for. So between 2015 and 2014, you should have 5,298 in 2015 and then 7,931 in 2014. Um, operations, uh, so we're going to kind of go back and take this one little section at a time. So operations is going to tell us that we had a positive operating income, right? Operations, we have a positive operating income um, and depreciation cash flow. We bumped up our inventory, so we maybe we're getting more patients in, which is great, and we need to account for that and bring more supplies in. Um, and our receivables are going up, which means we're getting more patients in, we're sending more bills out. We were able to go through and pay off some things that we owed. Um, maybe you know we had some bills that we need to pay out to some of our creditors for supplies that we bought, so we're able, we're starting to bring down our debt a little. Um, and so when we consider all these different cash flows and things moving around, we can tell that we generated a very large and very positive cash flow, about five, almost $5.3 million from operations. Um, so we had a lot of great things happening in terms of our operating activities. So then we switch over to look at our investing activities. Same setup here, right? So our capital expenditures, we have a negative 9,000. And then we have, um, we bought some short-term securities. We had some income come in from investments that we've made. Um, so some interest income that we had come in at, at a little over 4,000. But we purchased some securities and uh, about 5,000, and then we purchased some long-term securities, so more than a year, um, a little over 22,000. So our net cash from investing is going to be 30, negative 32,000 for 2015. And then look at the change in our position from 2014 to 2013. We got a little bit more into investing um, in 2015, didn't we? I think I said 2013. I didn't mean 2013. I meant 2014. So we got a little more... Um, into investing, we have maybe a little more disposable cash, if you will, that we could invest in these different activities. Um, so we invested heavily in fixed assets. Um, we purchased some new short-term and long-term securities. Um, but we invested overall, we were very financially healthy to the point where we can invest about $32 million in, right? So we're, we're in a very good position financially because now we can start making all these investments. And then cash flows from financing, so you can see in 2014, we didn't have any loans. We didn't even take out any loans. Um, but maybe operations increased. Um, we needed to take out some uh, bank loans or, again, you know, we made some uh, investment activities in 2015. So we had some net cash from financing in terms of financing activities at $32,000. Uh, we saw an increase in our cash at 56.16, and then our cash and equivalents at the beginning of the period, 6,486. So what do we notice here? We took our cash and equivalents at the end, kind of like what we saw on the um, uh, income statement, right? So we took our cash and equivalents at the end from 2014. That's what we started the year out or the period out with. 
Um, and then our cash equivalents at the end, 12,000. So you just add your net increase and your cash equivalents together at the beginning. Do you need to go back for a second? How did you do 5616? The net increase, decrease, and cash. So 5616. That may be a typo. I'm just saying, I was trying to do this on the fly. Well, what did you use? Like, what, what are you using to get that? Okay. Um, so you just add the cash equivalents together. Um, and then you add your cash equivalents together. Okay. 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 If you take the net cash from operations, mm -hmm. add that to the net cash from investing, and add that to the net cash from financing, you're going to get 5616. Okay. And that's going to be your net increase or decrease in cash. Remember we said we're looking at how cash flows through? And so those are our three main activities that we're looking at. If we add them together, that should give us an increase or hopefully not, but a decrease in in our cash position. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm not even put where does this number come from? Oh, it's good. <laughs> yeah, see, where does this number come from? Um, so we used a small amount of short-term debt. Uh, we increased our long-term debt. You know, it just kind of tells you a story, right, of what happened to the organization over this period of time. Um, so, uh, we uh, increased our use of debt by 32, uh, almost $33 million. Um, so, we, you know, made a lot of, of investment into short or long term securities or loans, or maybe we bought land or equipment. Um, so, we made a lot of investments into our business during 2015. So, when all the sections um, are considered, we had a positive cash flow, which we said was 5616 because we took the net cash from operations, added to that the net, net cash from investing, and added to that the net cash from financing to, to give us a positive uh, cash flow of 5616. Um, and the very bottom of the cash flow is going to reconcile this increase on the amount on the balance sheet. So what do you think? So... Given what we've just talked about, what do you think the most important line on this entire statement is? So we talked about the last time, you know, what's the most important thing on the balance sheet or what's the most important thing on the income statement. In terms of the statement of cash flows, what do you think the most important um, line item on the cash flow statement is? The increase or decrease in the cash, probably. Okay, why do you think that? Because that's your... The result of your investing, financing, and operations. Net cash. Okay. Yeah. Just net cash from operations because that's going to indicate how financially well off we are. Mm -hmm. Net cash from operations. Right, because we're looking at everything is tied to our patient service activities, right? So we want to know operationally how well we're doing. Um, so we have a couple different ratio analysis. Let me see how much we've got. Oh, okay. We're on this last one. We're almost at the end. Um, so we've got a couple different ratios that we're going to look at. Uh, and like I said, we, if you guys want math, don't worry. It's a coming. Um, but I'm just trying to kind of slowly, you know, dip your toe in water before we go full-fledged into these ratios that we're going to be talking about. So one that we can look at here with statement of cash flows um, when we take this kind of second look at, uh, at financial analysis is our debt ratio. Uh, so we have, so go ahead and calculate this out for me. We have our debt ratio is going to equal our total debt divided by our total assets. So let me erase this up some more time. Debt ratio, total debt, Divided by total assets. So what do you got? So our total assets is thirty-five 
purchase our actual debts are $100,747. Okay. Ashley says our total debt is $100,747. Where did you get that from? The balance sheet. Balance um, sheet. And where at? The total liability. Okay. And then what is our total assets? 8154. 815. 815. So everybody see where you got that? Both off the balance sheet. So total assets right above the line item for uh, liabilities and equity, 154815. And then total liabilities for our debt, 10747. Let's go ahead and calculate that out for me. Or I'll, never mind. I hit the button. <laughs> Um, so that's going to give us 0 0.65. Now this looks like a ratio we looked at when we looked at the statement, right? When we looked at our total margin ratio. So now we're looking at our debt ratio. So we have a debt ratio of... Grace is little, this little guy. So we have a debt ratio of 65%. So what does that mean? How do we interpret that debt ratio? Every dollar we get, we get 65% of so when we think of, we're thinking in terms of assets and liabilities. So each dollar of our asset by 65, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt him in here. Uh, so each dollar of our assets, we're going to finance with 65 cents of debt. So for every dollar we take out, we're going to get six, we're gonna have to go 65 cents into debt and 35 cents into equity to finance that. Come to the end. Any questions? Is it just information overload right now? No. A little? This is better than the other math stuff. Better than the other math yeah. stuff? Yeah. Okay, so when we think about what we just covered, which seemed really, really quick, <laughs> what uh, what do you think you would anticipate to see on the final? Or the final? The next exam? The ratios. Definitely the ratios, right? A balance sheet, uh, assets and liabilities. Okay, balance sheet uh, in terms of assets and liabilities. The basic accounting question. The basic, the basic accounting, accounting equation. equation. Okay. What else do you think? Probably just how to read the statements, right? What is it telling you? What else do you think? Or is that good? I think that's a good list. I think that's got pretty much covered. Like I said, next time we're going to, uh, within the next lecture or two, we're going to be talking about um, a lot a lot of more ratios. So we're going to be doing a lot of math um, and interpreting those ratios and what they mean and what they're telling us um, to set us up for the next exam. Um, but this is all I have this week for you guys. Um, we're finishing... Oh, two minutes early. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you guys walk out and you think of something, you're like, oh, I understood at the time, but, man, I can't remember what she said. You know, feel free to email me or call me anytime. You guys know I'm available. Um, so with that, that's all I have, and we'll see you guys next Tuesday. Thank you.